Welcome to The Music Reel. I'm your host, Nicola Burton. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with writer and cartoonist Amy Kurzweil. Now, Amy is also the author of the memoir, Flying Couch, and this received the 2016 New York Times Editor's Choice Award, and her comics appear regularly in The New Yorker. Amy, it's so lovely to finally meet you. How are you going? Great to meet you. Uh, pleasure to be here, see, meet you virtually. Um, yeah. Things are good. I just completed a cross-country road trip. So this is actually like the first day that I've kind of been more or less settled, not exactly in the place I'll be for a long time, but at least I have like a, a week in one place. So. <laughs> wow. so you've just moved from New York over to L.A.? I moved to, from New York to um, the middle of California, a place called San Luis Obispo. Wow. So I okay. With, yeah, I, I didn't want to leave New York. Uh, unlike all the people fleeing the New York pandemic, this was a, a, um, a love-inspired move. My partner got a job here. So <laughs> there you go. I, followed, I followed him. So I'm happy he has a job. I'm sad that I'm not in New York. Um, unlike... Yes. All the people who are in New York who want to leave, I didn't want to leave. But wow! So, so let's start with your lockdown story. Tell me about like what happened to you, how it impacted you, and then obviously what it's like right now in California. Yeah. <clears throat> well, when the lockdown hit, I was in New York on my own, um, and my partner was in California, which is where he had a job, and I guess I just kept feeling uh, like scared that we were going to be apart for, you know, we'd planned to be apart in this kind of way where we were going to be able to see each other um, here and there for that semester. But I was scared with the pandemic that, you know, we wouldn't be able to travel. And so I just told him like, you need to come to New York. <laughs> you need to, you need to get here somehow. And so he ended up driving across the country with a friend. Um, and then we went to stay with my parents in Massachusetts. Um, and you know, there was more space there. There was trees. We were able to help my parents with things like groceries and, you know, be together and have our little quarantine group, which, I mean, I couldn't have predicted that it would be five months of us just kind of in like low population Massachusetts doing sort of the same thing over and over again, but being safe, you know, at least, um, and then we just like moved everything online. So I was teaching a class uh, with Catapult, which is uh, my publisher, and they also do uh, classes. So that was supposed to be in person, but we moved that online. Um, and then I discovered that online teaching is actually an opportunity. So I, I started doing some of my own online teaching, which re went really well. It was sort of a bright spot in my quarantine to be able to do that. Um, and then it was just like, just being in one place for months and months, like most people, you know. Um, I and loved your cartoon <laughs> in the New Yorker on the 8th of July. I'm going to read it. it. It blows my mind. So you've, you've headlined it, No Money for the Arts. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm sorry, now that everyone's home reading, watching movies, educating themselves and reflecting on the meaning of life, there's just no money for the arts. You have perfectly articulated how we all feel. And, you know, in Australia, it's decimated us. So I'm not sure how it is over there for you. But I, I, I love that cartoon. I would love, can you tell me a little bit about how that came about and I guess what your thoughts are for the art sector post-COVID now that you've gone online and it's been a bright spot for you? Mm -hmm. What are the opportunities, I guess, that we've got now as a result of this experience? Yeah. I mean, as with everything, whenever there's an economic upset, the things that feed our soul like arts and education are the first to go and I've been working in as an artist obviously but also as a teacher for for basically my whole life and as an art someone in the arts part of teaching and it's just like that's always the first you know I used to work in public schools and like <clears throat> that was always the first thing to get cut and it was not even a surprise to people like that was just always how it went and so if, you know that cartoon came out of this like lifelong noticing um, of that habit and then you know fearing that that was going to happen again and seeing it happen again um, I mean there's some reason why we want to start to prioritize I guess science and technology because we think those are the things that are going to deliver us from catastrophes and there's some truth to that but but yeah I think 
artists are, you know, especially my friends who do like stand up comedy or any of my friends who do in person teaching who are having to transition in this way that they weren't necessarily prepared for. Uh, anyone I know, of course, who's in the music world, I mean, it's just like nothing you can do to replace that loss. So, I mean, for me, I, I have found that the, you know, the bright spot has been being able to sort of reach a broader world in this virtual space. Like, and it's ironic that I just did this cross cross country move with my partner. Um, and I was like, so sad about leaving the East coast and leaving New York, but actually my work hasn't changed at all because it's all in this virtual space. So that opportunity to like connect to each other. I mean, I would never have thought to like do a podcast, be on a podcast with somebody in Australia. I don't think anybody would have thought to reach out to me if it weren't for this moment. So that's like, I mean, I don't want to be cheesy about it, but that is the, the bright spot is that we can all be alone together. Um, you know, yeah, I agree. And it's not cheesy. It's actually how it is right now, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's changed us forever. I, um, I found your Google talk with your dad. Mm -hmm. um, and that was so interesting to talk about. You were talking about art and he was talking about like the virtual art experience. And it's mm -hmm. like, that, so that was what, 2017. It's almost quite prophetic in a way because here we are with this, you know, we are living online and we probably will for a few years now that now that we, I guess we've adapted. So can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, how things have changed in terms of how people appreciate art by working with you online? Have you noticed anything different? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's something interesting about technology that um, like, I mean, there's a lot of critiques I could make about the way technology has sort of changed the way we appreciate art. The main one just being how much time we give things. I think that that's like the kind of drawback of the technologies that we're inundated with today. Um, you know, so there's certainly like negatives in terms of us consuming all of our artistic content on screens. But I do think something I've noticed about consumption or something I've noticed about production of um, things like writing and comics um, is that there's something about the social media world that asks people for like increasing levels of intimacy. Um, so I've noticed, you know, in my news feeds, like over the years, just this tendency towards autobiography, um, like people sharing even, you know, not just my cartoonist friends, but like, or my artist friends, but like everyday people just like are encouraged to share intimate details about their life. Like there's something about the platforms that I think, you know, either positively or negatively reward people really like saying how they feel about things um, and having that reckoning moment of like, here's the post where I'm going to, you know, like tell all my friends how I really feel or tell all my friends that I've been going through something difficult. And um, like, I, I do think that there's more development that will come with new technological forms that will facilitate like, sort of deepening ways of people sharing their inner lives. But there's, it's just really interesting that we've had this turn lately, I think, with social media where people like are moving away from wanting to show this perfect image of their lives, you know, which is kind of what like Instagram and, and stuff like that was critiqued for encouraging at first. I do think people are like, no, actually things are terrible. <laughs> and especially now that it's like the norm that people feel bad about what's happening there's been like a kind of a, a sigh of relief on social media where people can share that. Yeah. And so, you know, in my classes um, on, you know, most of my classes, but especially lately, my students have been sharing personal intimate stories of hardship, hardship right now, hardship in the past. And comics is a really good medium for exploring emotional life. Um, there's something cathartic about drawing. So it's been nice to be able to offer that to people virtually, that support to sort of like tell intimate stories. And I agree, people actually relate to someone else being honest and going, you know what, life is shit. It's not Instagram. I'm really <laughs> struggling right now. And someone else looking at it going, oh, it's not just me. I'm okay. I'm okay. And I think, <laughs> you know, your book, Flying Couch, so it's, it's, a, so it's, it's a graphic memoir. Right, mm -hmm. it's about three generations: yourself, your mom, and your grandma. It's mm -hmm. a, you know you've created this platform to be able to share your story. I'd like to know a little bit about how that book came about because I watched um, 
on your website the trailer with you yeah. interviewing your grandmother. How cool is that? And her yeah. character, the survivor. So can you tell us a little bit about like how this book came about and, um, you know, how you feel about it now in terms of, well, shit, you know, we've got this really big challenge and your grandma, she's poised to help everyone through it because she's the survivor. So tell us yeah. a little bit about that and her character. Yeah, sure. So my grandmother, who I call Bubby, she's 94 years old. She's still around, um, still. I just saw her in Michigan from a safe distance. I was obviously very nervous about coming close to her. Um, as you might expect, she is not, she's not being irresponsible, but she is not that concerned about the pandemic, um, given what, you know, what she's seen in her life. She's a Holocaust survivor. She actually had typhus when she was like 14 years old and recovered from that. And she's just seen a lot of difficult, um, difficult things. And so I think because, you know, the pandemic isn't, the people around her are fine. It's like, it's like hard for her to really see like, you know, really see the risk to her just because her concept of not fine is like people, you know, like just dropping dead around her. So she's, she's like, she's kind of doing what she's supposed to do, but a little bit like rolling her eyes, like, okay, <laughs> like, which is like, you know, refreshing, I guess, as long as she's staying safe. Um, but anyway, to talk more about um, my book, I, I started writing that book, I think almost uh, like, over 10 years ago now when I was in college. Um, I started the book um, because I wanted to learn more about what happened to my grandmother, what her survivor story was. I always knew that she um, was born in, the, in Warsaw, that she lived through the Warsaw Ghetto, that everybody in her family died, and that she was the only one who made it out um, at age 13. She left her family and, and survived by disguising herself as a, as a non-Jewish person. And so I'd, I'd grown up with that story. And of course, you can imagine like hearing those stories as a, you know, a young person and a young adult, it, it impacts you, especially because I was comparing those stories to sto like to my life, which was nothing like that. You know, I was like a regular American person who had, you know, went to school and my biggest challenge was like, oh, I had to leave him home for college. Um, <laughs> so I, I was trying to reckon with my relate reckon with my relationship to her history and also to try to understand some things about myself like why did I have so much anxiety about relatively banal things um, and I, I started to sort of answer some of those questions I had about myself by looking into this history drawing some connections between sort of what she'd experienced and some of the fears that I think I'd internalized um, my mother is also a therapist and so she's this character who provides like insight into that journey um, you know, she's also my mother, so <laughs> we have all kinds of um, tension and love. And so the story uh, that I'm telling about my own family um, or that I'm telling about my relationship with those women, my mother and my grandmother, is interwoven between stories from my grandmother's survival story. Um, and so in terms of how I feel about it now, I still feel really close to the story it still feels like those themes come up again and again for me um you know especially like li you know living in close proximity with my parents and you know that intergenerational stuff that comes up um you know it feels like i'm still sort of living that story you know i just left my home in the east coast and came to california and so those themes of like leaving home and how you get along with your family and how their history stays with you, I think, continue to feel relevant, um, which is like a sign that I, I, you know, I did something, something that I can be proud of in that book. Um, but I will say, you know, now that it's been like four years since it came out, um, my drawing style has changed a lot. So I'm a little embarrassed when I look, <laughs> look at the drawings and feel kind of like, you know, no. I didn't know how to draw certain things back then, but that's okay. That's inevitable. Yeah, but the story is still incredible, especially as you say, when you look at it juxtapositioned against 2020 and the mm -hmm. time with a family and it, it gives you this great opportunity to really see, well, who am I? You know, who are they? And, and, and you get this introspection. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it is a story of great relevance right now, in particular, your grandmother's story of survival. I love how she's not taking the pandemic so seriously because she's 
Eric, I love that. It's she's obviously got a lot of wisdom, so you know, you're very lucky to have that, you know, relationship with her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to say that she isn't. She knows the pandemic is real. She, you know, she believes in that. She believes that we need to do what what we're supposed to do. But I think from her perspective, it's like, okay, you got to stay home. Like you're fine. Yeah. At least you have a home, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's a great perspective. So yeah. with 2020, you know, you've made this massive move. What does the rest of it look like for you, considering, you know, you guys over there are facing this huge election and it looks like, you know, from, from our perspective, we're just like, what is going on in America? So how do you feel about everything that's going on over there and what's, rest, what's left for you for the rest of this year? Yeah. I mean, I can talk about sort of my own life. That's easier to talk about the country as a whole is a little overwhelming, but I can try to speak to that also. But, um, but with my own life, I, I um, got this fellowship, which is supposed to be in Berlin, Germany. And I'm, of course, the travel ban um, prevents me from going over there yet. It's possible that we as researchers for this fellowship will get an exemption and I'll get to travel, but that hasn't come through yet. So I've just kind of been you know, we just did this move and now we're, my partner and I are trying to get a place to live more longer term. And then I'm just waiting to see if I get to go do this cool experience, which, you know, in normal times would be like such a great opportunity to go somewhere, you know, make connections in a new country, share my work. And I'm working on another book, which I can do from anywhere, but it's always nice to work on a book somewhere where like there's other artists working hard also. So I don't know if I'm going to get to do that. That's just kind of the question mark. Um, and it's been hard to just, it's really been hard to make any plans at all beyond like a week, which has been a good coping strategy for making all these changes and, you know, anxiety about what's possible and who you can see and what you can do. It's like, you just take it one day at a time and you just like get through, like, do I have a place to sleep tonight? Okay, I'm fine. Like, that's all that matters. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm just going to be working on my, my next book wherever I am, um, probably doing more teaching online um, at some point also, um, continuing to do cartoons for The New Yorker and, you know, just living my life as usual in a more quiet way. Um, as for the country as a whole, oh man, I mean, I just feel like I've, I, it, it I have to like, first of all, I have to take breaks from the news and breaks from social media there. I try to keep in mind that like, you know, that the news is designed to keep me outraged. <laughs> so I try to just like remind myself to just sort of take a deep breath every once in a while and like do what I can in terms of like raising money or, you know, doing fundraisers, which I've done a little bit of that and just trying to focus on what is productive but it does feel like when you look at the news that there's just like i mean first of all i'm in california now which is literally on fire <laughs> so i was just gonna say it feels like there's fires everywhere both literal and metaphorical um but the like it, it feels like there's just like so much terrible stuff happening and it's true that there is terrible stuff happening but when you go outside and you know you take a walk down the street like people are still okay like people are still you know going out to eat sitting outdoors wearing their masks like there is some semblance of life happening I think I saw that in New York when I was there you know people were in parks they were you know taking walks together being fairly responsible like following social distancing guidelines and being able to like do things like that you know here in San Luis Obispo it's the same like you know people are are out they're okay they're with their families like it's good to remind yourself that people still exist and are still, you know, um, living their lives as best they can. Um, with the election, I think I, I know I'm in a bubble of like, you know, progressive liberal people. Um, I feel some conflict between like the progressive, more left friends and colleagues that I have whose ideas resonate with me a little bit more. And then, you know, the more like moderate liberal um, folks who like, you know, ended up sort of getting the, the candidate that they wanted. Um, and for me, I just feel like we just got to get Trump out of there. And I'm kind of on board to just support the Democratic Party in, in whatever way I can. But there is conflict, I think, between like, younger 
you know, people who are academics and artists also who want, like, who wanted our country to change more, and we're disappointed that they, that they didn't get to see that happen. Um, in terms of people who support Trump, it's like I'm just in such a bubble. I know very few people who support Trump. And I, I, I try to make it a point to, like, seek out and learn from people who have a different perspective um, to sort of figure out how someone like Trump gained popularity. I think it has a lot to do with social media and sort of the outrage culture that we're in it has a lot to do with like the embers of racism and anti-Semitism and misogyny and all that, which um, I do think we've made a lot of progress on in this country, but it's definitely still there. So I just try to understand it, but it is kind of remarkable that like if you're on one side of the political spectrum here, it's so, so rare that you really get to have a good conversation with someone who's on the other side. And so I, I would really, I really want to look for that. I, I found it hard to find. Um, and I think the virtual stuff actually makes it harder because we are in these like echo chambers with, with the people who think like us. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. if you have any good ways for how to get out of that, I'm, <laughs> I'm all ears. <laughs> Well, it's, it's weird for us observing what's going on over there because we don't know. But it just yeah. looks like everything's exploding from what the media is saying. And I think you're right. Their job is to, you know, keep us all in alarm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, if I can find a Trump supporter, I'll send them to you so that you can have a chat to them. Because, um, you know, we have a completely different system over here. We're just looking at you guys thinking, what is going on? I mean, yeah. You know, the year was already crazy with the pandemic and then, you know, with all the stuff with Black Lives Matter, all that happening. And now you've got your election. It's, um, I'm, I'm like you, I try to switch off as much as possible. And I think yeah. your advice is really wise to just live in the moment, just deal with that and then go to the next thing because we've got no control other than that, have we? Yeah, and I think also trying to, like, trying to seek out... Um, information about what real people are doing rather than reading headlines has been helpful for me. So like the protest is a really good example. Um, you know, you read, you read these headlines about the protests, you look at Twitter and people are focusing on destruction and, you know, violence and, and then fighting about whether or not violence is justified. But then I look on my, you know, my Instagram, you know, looking at people's Instagram stories who were in New York at the protests. Um, I, I didn't go to the protest because I was with my parents who were older and I just didn't want to take risks. But, um, but I was like kind of participating virtually seeing my friends who were there. And it was just like really peaceful, really inspiring, you know, people just like marching together, you know, lots of, I don't know, lots of positive signs, lots of positive like energy and it's just nothing like what you see sort of in the incendiary stuff in the headlines. And so I've been trying to like seek out what are my friends who are connected to these things I see headlines about doing, what are they seeing? How can I like ground the conclusions I come to in those pieces of information um, rather than just like getting outraged um, by the headlines I see. That's amazing. So it was peaceful because it didn't look peaceful to us. Wow. I, I think some, you know, there was some isolated, isolated, like kind of mob stuff that happens. But most of the, I mean, all of my friends who are at the protests in New York experience absolutely no violence whatsoever. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's like, yeah, there is always a sort of tendency in the news to lean into the stuff that makes people more outraged because it yeah. gets more money for advertisers <laughs> true, but it is so refreshing yeah. to hear your story amy because we weren't there so at that yeah you've actually added this great piece to that puzzle so thank you mm -hmm. look mm -hmm. i'm excited about your new book i'll be watching what you do and and trying to order that when it's released and i hope you do get to berlin and I guess mm -hmm. finally, I'd really like to see that at some point in history, you can do another cartoon about the arts, but it'll be one where we're actually celebrated. We're actually part of the recovery of the world. What do you yeah. think? <laughs> yeah, I will try. I mean, I'll keep that. I'm working on my New Yorker batch. Uh, the cartoons are due on Tuesdays. So I'm working on that now. And I will uh, I'll think about if I can throw a positive arts cartoon the in there. Recovery arts thing would be just to, you know, I guess, boy, everyone in the world going, you know what, you are not alone. We are going to recover. You're going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Thank, Thank you. you so much for talking to me today. For we we worked out the times, we we worked around our schedules, and we finally <laughs> made it. And it's so lovely to meet you and to hear your perspective. And I wish you the very best with everything that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your thoughtful questions and for getting up at eight a.m. I know that's. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye. -bye.